بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى جميع إخوانه من النبيين والمرسلين وآل كل وصحب كل ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا All praise is due to Allah and may Allah raise the rank of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and protect his nation from that which he fears for them Dear brothers and sisters in Islam, let us first have the proper intention in our hearts to attend the lesson for the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our previous lesson, we concluded talking about the integrals of the prayer. We talked about the emphasized recommendations in the prayer and other recommended matters that are less emphasized. And in our lesson tonight, we'll be talking about the matters by which women differ from men with respect to the prayer. Now the integrals are the same, the recommended matters, mostly the same. But there are certain things that women differ from men with respect to the prayer. <coughs> Al-Qadi Abu Shuja' may Allah raise his rank, counted them as four matters. He said, the man spreads his elbows from his sides and raises his stomach from his thighs while bowing and prostrating. That's the first thing. Recites audibly when appropriate, says subhanallah to alert for something during the prayer and the prohibited nakedness of the man is the area between his navel and his knees. Whereas women draw themselves together when bowing and prostrating, a woman lowers her voice in the presence of marriageable men, claps to alert for something during the prayer, and a free woman must cover her entire body except her face and her hands while a female slave covers the same as a man. So in this chapter he is talking about the matters in which women differ from men with respect to the prayer. <coughs> and the first one is regarding bowing and prostrating. It is recommended for one when bowing to straighten his back with his neck so it won't be bent, it's straightened as the Prophet wasallam used to do. That's for men and women. The back is straightened with the neck and also to straighten his legs. Now, a slight bend does not affect the proper ruku'a. We did mention before that the excessive bend to an extent where one will be bending too much and he's straightening his back up, he won't be in a way of making ruku'a. 
and that will be invalid. But many people would bend a little bit when making ruku'ah. It won't be fully straightened. This does not affect the ruku'ah, the bowing. However, what is better recommended is to straighten his legs and to straighten his back with his neck as well. Now, as for men, they don't draw themselves together when bowing and prostrating. Rather, when one places his palms on his knees, the men, he will extend his arms away from his body. So he doesn't keep them close to his body. That's for men. While for women, they do not do this. They do not spread the arms away from the body. Rather, they keep them close to the body. And that is more suitable and more appropriate for women. So when you place your palms on your knees in the bowing, you keep your arms, elbows away from your body. Same when making prostration, sujood. You don't keep your arms and elbows close to your body, rather you spread them out away from your body. That's what is recommended for men. The case is not the same for women as they need to close, to draw closer to each other. So they draw their elbows closer to their bodies. That is more appropriate for them. It was mentioned that during the prayer, the Prophet wasallam, when making prostration, he used to make a gap between his hands, away from each other, spread them away from each other, so away from his body, to an extent that uh, those praying behind the Prophet وسلم, can see his underarm. So he's not closing his arms to his body, he is spreading them. And that's what is recommended for men. And also it is recommended to keep his stomach away from his thighs when making prostration. When you go to the prostration position, you do not attach your stomach with your thighs, rather you stay away from it. Keep your stomach away from your thighs. That's what the Prophet وسلم, used to do. Did you picture the image, what we're talking about? So when making prostration for men, you spread your arms, keep them away from your body, and you keep your stomach away from your thighs. Now, uh, for women, they do the same as in ruku'ah. So they keep the arms to their bodies, close to their bodies, and they do not spread them away from their bodies that is more appropriate for them. However, there is something that some people might fall into, which is not the recommended thing. Some of them will attach the elbow to the ground. So when they make sujood, they put the whole arm from the fingers to the elbow attached to the ground. This is not recommended. Rather, the recommendation is to keep your elbow away from the ground. And this is for men and women. So even when women pray, they do not attach the arms. Some might say, um, like the sitting of the dog, we don't do this. That's not recommended. Rather, you keep your elbow away from the ground. The difference is the man spreads them while a woman keeps them close to their body. That's the difference between them. Now regarding reciting audibly, now for men, 
Whenever it is appropriate, it is recommended to recite audibly where the others can hear, it is recommended. It's disliked not to. So in Maghrib prayer, for instance, it is recommended to recite audibly. If you were to choose to recite just in a way that you can hear yourself, so not audible for others, that is disliked. And if it is appropriate not to recite audibly, like when praying Zuhur and Asr, it's not recommended to recite audibly and that's disliked. So in Maghrib, Isha and Subah, you recite audibly, others can hear you. But in Zuhur and Asr, you do not recite audibly, rather you raise your voice just to an extent where you can hear yourself. Now that's for men. What about for women? If she is praying by herself in her house, in Maghrib, Isha and Subah, she would raise her voice, but less than the way a man raises his voice, less, not to, the, to this extent. If there are marriageable men present in this session, then she wouldn't raise her voice, she wouldn't recite audibly in that case. So even in Maghrib and Isha and Subah prayer. So even if she were to pray Maghrib, if she's by herself, she would raise her voice. But what about in the presence of marriageable men, then she wouldn't recite audibly. She would recite just to an extent where she can hear herself. That's the difference as well. Another difference between men and women with respect to the prayer is that if something were to occur during the prayer and the one praying needs to alert about it, the man would say, Subhanallah. Like for instance, if you are praying Aisha for rakahs, in the fourth rakah, Instead of sitting for the last sitting and saying tashahud and salah on the Prophet wasallam, the Imam forgot and he went up to make a fifth rakah. You don't follow the Imam in the fifth rakah. Now here you need to alert the Imam. But you don't say to him, because we're going to talk about this shortly, you don't say to him, you already prayed for why are you going to the fifth rak'ah? Because that invalidates your prayer. So how are you going to alert the Imam? The scholar said, you say, Subhanallah. You say, Subhanallah. And according to the school of Imam Shafi'i, radiyallahu anhu, you have to be careful. When saying Subhanallah, it must be said. It must be said. Either with the mere intention of praising Allah Azza wa Jal, or praising Allah plus alerting the Imam. But if one were to have the intention merely to alert the Imam by saying Subhanallah, according to the school of Imam Shafi'i, this invalidates the prayer. So it can't be just to alert the Imam. It's either you combine to this intention, the intention of praising Allah, or you can have the intention merely to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now some other Shafi'is mention that even if it were only with the intention of alerting the Imam, this does not invalidate one's prayer. But as for you to be on the safe side, if such a matter were to happen to you while praying and you want to alert for something, if you were to say Subhanallah, 
keep the intention to say it with the intention of praising Allah Azza wa Jal. Or for instance, you see a blind man who is about to fall into a well. Now here, you would say subhanallah as well. Maybe he can be alerted when you say subhanallah. If he doesn't listen or he doesn't understand why you're saying subhanallah and he keeps walking and he's about to fall into it, here, even if you were to interrupt your prayer by saying to him, watch out, you are about to fall into the well, you have a reason. And here you have to. But in the first stage, you try to alert him by saying, Subhanallah. If he figures out why you're saying Subhanallah and he stops, that's fine. Otherwise, to save him, you might interrupt your prayer and you might rush to him. Same when you see a child who is about to fall off a balcony, for instance. You don't say, I'm praying, so I want to finish my prayer. Now you go to save the child. So even if you were to interrupt your prayer, because there is a need in that case to interrupt your prayer. So you interrupt your prayer, you save the child, then you start your prayer all over again. That's what you do. So if a man is praying, and while he's praying something were to occur, and he wants to alert about it, he would say subhanallah as we explain as for the lady the lady would clap and the way to clap is not like normal clapping no rather she taps the right palm on the outer part of the left hand like this this is the way she claps in the prayer if she were to alert about something and she doesn't say subhanallah. Now if she says subhanallah, it doesn't invalidate her prayer. It doesn't affect her prayer. Uh, and even if the man were to clap in that way, it does not affect the validity of his prayer. But both will be going against what is recommended. Because the Prophet sallallahu said in the hadith, مَنْ نَابَهُ شَيْءٌ فِي صَلَاتِهِ فَلْيُسَبِّحْ فَإِنَّهُ إِذَا سَبَّحَ الْتُفِتَ إِلَيْهِ وَإِنَّمَا التَّصْفِيقُ لِلنِّسَاءِ So if something were to happen while praying, let one say Subhanallah. That's what the Prophet said. Because when one says Subhanallah, he will alert others about it. So they will understand why he's saying Subhanallah. And he should not clap as clapping is for women. So in this way. Now even if they were to clap the other way around by normal clapping, if it's out of playing, this invalidates the prayer. Because one movement out of playing invalidates the prayer. And they said playing nullifies the concept of praying. So when one is praying, he doesn't do anything out of playing. One movement, even if you were to undo the button with the intention of playing, that invalidates your prayer. Also amongst the differences that were mentioned here is regarding the prohibited nakedness. For men, the prohibited nakedness is the area between the navel and the knees. That's the area that is classified for men as prohibited nakedness. This must be covered. This must be covered when praying, otherwise the prayer is invalid. Now according to Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu, Abu Hanifa, a saying of Imam Malik, a saying of Imam Ahmad. The thigh is part of the prohibited nakedness. <coughs> there is a saying according to Imam Malik and one of the sayings of Imam Ahmad that the thigh is not part of the prohibited nakedness for men. Now, 
they relied on the hadith that the Prophet sallallahu said to a companion called Jarhad, cover your thigh because the thigh is part of the prohibited nakedness. Others relied on the hadith from the root of Anas that the Prophet sallallahu once uncovered his thigh. Al-Bukhari radiyallahu anhu said the hadith of Jarhad is safer to be followed. However, the hadith of Anas is more authenticated. Meaning, although the hadith of Anas is narrated with stronger chains of narration, but to take with the hadith of Jarhad is safer. Because many scholars said the thigh is part of the prohibited nakedness. Some scholars said it's not. So you take the safe side and you cover your thigh when you pray. And take into account that even according to the saying of Imam Malik radiallahu anhu, who said that the thigh is not part of the prohibited nakedness for men, if you were to pray wearing shorts, your prayer will be without rewards. So you won't get rewards in your prayer in such a case. And according to other scholars, it's invalid. So to be on the safe side, you cover your side. You cover your side. So always take with what is safer and that is better for you. That's why Imam al-Bukhari said the hadith of Jarhad he said hadith of Jarhad ahwat wa hadith of Anas asnad hadith of Jarhad is safer to be followed and hadith Anas is more authenticated. Now when he said the area between the navel and the knees we know from this that according to the school of Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu and Imam Shafi'i explicitly mentioned this that the navel and the knees are not part of the awrah they are not part of the prohibited nakedness according to the school of Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu as for the free woman not a slave the prohibited nakedness is the entire body except for the face and the hands. The entire body except for the face and the hands. And that is the meaning when we say the hands up to the wrist. So not higher than this. Allah Ta'ala said, وَلَا يُبِدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا They should not show, reveal of their adornment except what is apparent. Now what's the meaning of what is apparent إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet and she knows about these details as a woman, the wife of the Prophet and Abdullah ibn Abbas the cousin of the Prophet, the interpreter of the Qur'an, Tarjuman al-Qur'an, they both said the meaning of except what is apparent is the face and the hands, up to the wrists, as we mentioned. So the entire body is a prohibited nakedness for ladies, except for the face and the hands. And we understand from this that the face is not part of the prohibited nakedness. If the face is awrah for woman, meaning part of the prohibited nakedness, she wouldn't have been ordered to uncover it in the state of ihram when performing hajj or umrah. A lady is not allowed to cover the face when she is in the state of ihram for hajj or umrah. She is not allowed to. So had the face been part of the prohibited nakedness for women, 
They wouldn't have been ordered in our religion to uncover the face when in the state of Ihram, either for Hajj or Umrah. Because some people these days go to the extreme and say that it is a must upon every Muslim woman to cover her face as well. This is not true. What the scholars said, as relayed by Al Qadi Iyad, Al Maliki, and others, that a woman is allowed to uncover the face by consensus. And men are the ones who are ordered to lower their gaze. So the man is not allowed to look at the face of a woman lustfully. But she is allowed to uncover the face. So that's by consensus. The face is not part of the prohibited nakedness for ladies. So remember this. And once as well, a lady from the tribe of Khas'am, from the tribe of Khas'am, came to the Prophet وسلم, on the day of Eid. And she wanted to ask the Prophet about a matter related to Hajj, pilgrimage. When she was asking, you know, they are not allowed to cover the face during the state of Ihram, as we mentioned. So her face was uncovered. Al-Fadl ibn al-Abbas, the brother of Abdullah ibn Abbas. Al-Fadl was with the Prophet. He started staring at her and she started staring at him. He was handsome. So he liked her beauty and she liked him as a handsome person. So she started staring at him and he started staring at her. What did the Prophet ﷺ do in such a case? He turned the face of his cousin to the other side. He turned the face of his cousin to the other side. The proof is, he didn't say to her, it's haram, how could you uncover your face? Because she was in the state of Ihram. Although he witnessed what happened, he didn't say, look what you have done, you tempted him, you seduced him, cover your face, it's a must. He didn't say this. So despite what happened, when the Prophet ﷺ was asked, he said, I saw a young man and a young woman, so I was worried that the devil might interfere in between. So, for that reason, the Prophet turned the face of his cousin to the other side. So he didn't say to her, you have to cover your face. This incident took place about 80 days before the death of the Prophet So it was after the ayah of hijab, they call it hijab, meaning the covering, was revealed. So it was towards the end of the life of the Prophet After the ayahs related to a woman covering the prohibited nakedness, were revealed to the Prophet So the scholar said that shows that she doesn't have to cover the face. She doesn't have to cover the face. However, this is a recommended matter in other than the state of Ihram. But when she is in the state of Ihram, she doesn't cover the face as this is forbidden. By this we concluded talking about the differences between men and women with respect to the prayer. Now we'll talk about the invalidators of the prayer. Al-Qadi Abu Shuja, may Allah raise his rank, said, There are 11 matters that invalidate the prayer. 11 matters. First, the intentional talking, intentional speech with 
what people converse with each other. So he's not praising Allah because praising Allah does not invalidate the prayer. If one is praying and while standing, he started saying, Subhanallah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. This is praising Allah. And the prayer is a set of praises. So this does not invalidate the prayer. So what type of talk invalidates the prayer? The talk that people converse with each other with. When they talk to each other, open the door, close the window, sit down, stand up. This type of talk, if done deliberately, invalidates the prayer. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that explicitly in the hadith, إن هذه الصلاة لا يصلح فيها شيء من كلام الناس Meaning this prayer, in the prayer one is not allowed to say any of the words that people converse with each other using these words. Because this invalidates the prayer when done deliberately. One word, two letters. One letter that has a meaning. Like in Arabic, if you say qi, it means protect yourself. So although it's one letter as qaf with kasra at the end, qi, but it means protect yourself. If you say i, meaning watch out. Be cautious, be aware of. So that's only one letter with kasra. So even if one were to pronounce one letter has a meaning in the prayer deliberately, that invalidates his prayer. One letter but extended, like to say, oh, long letter. It's when you extend the letter as in adding a vowel to it, it makes it as, as if it's two letters. And if done deliberately, that invalidates one's prayer as well. If one let us say was a follower in the prayer and the Imam was reciting verses related to hellfire, if he says, ah, oh, that invalidates his prayer. If one is in pain and he says, ah, oh, deliberately, that invalidates his prayer. Or a person might say, ah, we in slang, we might say, ah, to show, express that we are in pain. This invalidates the prayer as well, if done deliberately. If it's done unintentionally, someone was overwhelmed by the pain and it came out as a slip of the tongue let us say he has a back pain and as he was standing up so he had a sharp pain and indeliberately he said ah oh, or ah oh, for instance this does not invalidate his prayer now the scholars talked about crying, expressing one's pain, laughing and the like, when done in the prayer, if two letters were to come out in such a case, then this invalidates one's prayer. So if one laughs deliberately and two letters come out when laughing, this invalidates his prayer. And uh, also, if one cries, and when crying, he pronounces two letters deliberately, that invalidates his prayer. So one has to be cautious. Even they talked about coughing. Someone is reciting, and he felt that he needs to cough. Now, if he thinks that he cannot recite the Fatiha properly, unless he coughs, even if two letters were to be pronounced in such a case, 
And that's a reason, that's an excuse. He needs to recite the Fatiha. But if there is no need, you know how some people say, hem, hem, something like this. So when he says something like this, he's pronouncing letters. If there is no need for that, that invalidates one's prayer. If you were to recite the Fatiha and he's unable to pronounce properly, unless he makes this type of coughing to pronounce properly, even if two letters were to be pronounced, then there is a need in it and that does not invalidate one's prayer. Now here we mention if this were to happen deliberately, what about someone uttered two letters or more, but this wasn't deliberate? If it's not too much, then his prayer remains valid. Let us say someone didn't know you are praying, and you were praying, and your mom called you, and as you are praying, you forgot that you are praying and you answered your mom. Yes, I am here while you're praying. Then you remember that you're praying. This does not invalidate your prayer. Because such a statement or a sentence is classified as a little talk. Now what is too much, the scholars in the school of Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu mentioned is more than six statements. Like for instance um, to say, go to the marketplace, this is a sentence. <coughs> Buy such and such, that's a sentence. Bring him back home, that's a sentence. Put him in the fridge, that's a sentence. So more than six sentences even if one forgot that he's praying and he talked with the talk of people too much, more than six sentences, then this invalidates his prayer. Even if he forgot. If intentionally we said two letters invalidates his prayer. Or one letter that has a meaning. But if he forgot he's praying and he said a sentence, this does not invalidate his prayer because that won't be classified as too much. It's little talk. Someone might call you while you're praying and you answer them. But not to the extent that uh, while knowing that talking deliberately with the talk of people invalidates one's prayer then doing as such definitely invalidates his prayer. But one, if one is unaware of the fact that such a thing invalidates his prayer, like he's a new convert, he converted to Islam, he's learning how to pray, they taught him how to pray, but they haven't told him about the invalidators of the prayer. And he was praying and someone talked to him, so he answered him and he continued the prayer. Because he is new to Islam, he is unaware of this, his prayer remains valid. Let me mention this for you, like it happened once that people were praying in congregation and one of the mobile phones rang. So it was ringing and we were praying. Someone in the back answered the phone. When he answered the phone and we're praying, he said, brother, I cannot talk to you. I'm praying now. I'm in the second rakah. Call me after five minutes. And he continued his prayer. If he is a new convert, he is unaware of the judgment, then his prayer remains valid. But if one knows that talking as such invalidates one's prayer and he does this deliberately, this definitely invalidates his prayer. The second matter that invalidates one's prayer, the excessive motions or movements. Now to define this, the scholars gave an example like three steps, three steps. 
And you might ask someone to move forward in the prayer. If he makes the three steps, then this invalidates his prayer. This, this is classified as excessive movements. Now the scholars even talked about was classified as a step. If one were to put one leg forward and bring the one at the back next to it, they said this is one step. This is classified as one step. But if one were to walk like this, then put the one at the back in front of the one, they already moved forward, then like this, as if he's walking. This nullifies the concept of praying. So if you look at him, now you see someone walking. So he nullified the concept of being in the prayer. That's why it invalidates his prayer. Also, they talked about the consecutive hits, such as, let's say, punching. And uh, we're talking here not out of playing. Out of playing, one movement invalidates one's prayer. If it's out of playing. You know how sometimes little kids would stand. You need to teach them this. And while they are praying, they might give an elbow to each other. So out of playing. So one little movement invalidates their prayer in that case. But here we're talking about the excessive movements. And also, there is a consensus amongst the scholars that the excessive movements nullifies the concept of being praying. So one wouldn't be seen as if he is praying when making all these excessive movements. But the scholars had differences regarding what is classified as excessive movements and what is classified as not. Now, it was narrated that once the Prophet ﷺ stepped forward and the door was in the direction of the Qibla and he opened the door for our Lady Aisha then he went back and continued the prayer. So stepping forward, like one step, opening the door, going back. So this was classified as not being excessive movements. So the scholars in the school of Imam Shafi'i concluded from this that what is equivalent to one rak'ah, consecutive movements, equivalent to one rak'ah invalidates one's prayer. Some other scholars in the school of Imam Shafi'i said three consecutive movements invalidates one's prayer. So if one were to move the right hand and the left hand and his head after each other consecutively, this invalidates his prayer. Three movements. But uh, the little movements like the movements of the fingers, this does not invalidate one's prayer. So if one, let us say, were to raise his hand to his head while praying, so that's he, he made one movement and he started scratching his head using only his fingers. Those won't be classified as movements. These little movements of the fingers, blinking of the eye, this is not a movement here in our topic. So like moving a big organ like the hand, the leg, the head, that's a movement. Also, amongst the invalidators of the prayer, as mentioned by Al-Qadi Abu Shuja' Al-Hadath, the ritual impurity, whether minor or major ritual impurity, if that were to occur during the prayer, one's prayer becomes invalid. One's prayer becomes invalid. 
In the hadith, the Prophet وسلم, mentioned that if one were to be praying and while praying he passes wind, then let him leave his prayer, make wudu, and repeat his prayer. So the Prophet وسلم, told us about this judgment, so whether it happened intentionally or un unintentionally, this invalidates one's prayer. So if you are praying and your wudu becomes invalid for passing wind, for instance, you are not allowed to continue your prayer without having wudu. It's a major sin. Because your prayer is invalid. Now you withdraw from the line, you make wudu and you start your prayer all over again. That's what you need to do. You do not say, how can I withdraw from the congregation? People will talk about me, it's embarrassing and the like. Then he would continue as if he's praying, bowing, prostrating, but without wudu, that's haram, that's a major sin. He is not allowed to do this. Also, the contamination with the unexempted filthy najat substance that invalidates one's prayer as well. So if someone were to be praying and let us say there was on the floor unexempted nageous filthy substance and while he's praying he touched it that invalidates his prayer he contaminated himself with it what about if someone is praying the scholar said and the najasa dry najasa comes on his shoulders let us say while praying, if he can shrug off his shoulders, make it fall to the ground, he can continue the prayer. But if it's wet, that's it. It penetrates through his clothes and that invalidates his prayer. But if one were to remove it, if it's dry and he wants to remove it, this doesn't happen by his hand. So he won't grab it by his hand if he does so as if he carried the najasa and that invalidates his prayer. An example is to shrug off his shoulder to make it fall to the ground. In that case his prayer remains valid and this does not affect the validity of his prayer. What about if it is exempted, najas filthy substance? This does not invalidate his prayer like... Uh, while praying, let us say, while praying, there was a lice, you know, the head lice on his clothes and while he's praying, he killed it. This is something that many people are expected to be inflicted with. All these bugs, little bugs, they might come on them. And while they are praying, so they might smash them when they are praying, squash them on their clothes. So this is exempted. So these little bugs, if they get squashed on their bodies, whether on the clothes or on the body, this is exempted. But here we're talking about the unexempted filthy nageous substance. And we did mention before about if someone were to have blood from his self, from his injury, if that blood comes on his clothes, his prayer remains valid because that's the blood of his own injury, not from others. If he was contaminated with blood from others, now the scholar said if it's a little amount, he can pray with his clothes, but if it's a big amount, it's not exempted. Also amongst the invalidators of the prayer is uncovering 
the prohibited nakedness on purpose. Even if one were to cover himself quickly, that's it, his prayer has become invalidated. So for instance, something very important for ladies we need to mention. That when making prostration, the forehead must be uncovered. So if you're having the scarf covering the whole forehead, so you haven't left even part of it uncovered, you cannot make prostration on the scarf. So let us say you wanted to fix the scarf while praying. If you uncover your head to fix it, this invalidates one's prayer. Or let us say maybe someone is wearing, like you know the abaya for instance, that long piece of garment. But for instance, let us say he's wearing shorts underneath. And while praying he wanted to go to the prostration, so he pulled it up and he uncovered his thigh. That invalidates his prayer, even if he were to cover it quickly afterwards. That's it, he uncovered intentionally, that invalidates his prayer. The scholars talked about something. If it were to be uncovered due to the strong wind, a strong wind blew and it uncovered his prohibited nakedness. So it's unintentional. It's due to the strong wind. If he were to cover quickly and immediately, then his prayer remains valid. But not the one who was short in the first place in covering the prohibited nakedness. Like some ladies, for instance, they might wear short sleeves and they have a cover on top. But when they say Allahu Akbar or they go for ruku'ah, it will be seen, it show up. This invalidates the prayer. Because they were short in the first place in covering the prohibited nakedness. Amongst the invalidators of the prayer is changing the intention. Because once you start the prayer, your intention must remain that you are praying until you finish. So if you were to intend to terminate your prayer while praying, this invalidates your prayer. The case is not the same when fasting. If someone is fasting and during the day he says, I, wanna, I don't want to continue fasting, I want to break my fast. For just having this intention does not invalidate his fasting. But in the prayer, if he were to intend to interrupt his or to terminate his prayer, it becomes invalid. If one were to intend that I'm going to interrupt my prayer in the second rakah, and he is in the first rakah now, this is invalid as well. This invalidates his prayer as well. If one were to hesitate whether to terminate his prayer or not, someone is knocking on the door and he becomes hesitant about interrupting the prayer. So should I interrupt her? No, I want to interrupt her. No, I don't want to. If he becomes in this hesitation situation, this invalidates his prayer as well. Even if he were to make interrupting his prayer contingent upon happening something. He's waiting for a phone call from someone. If he were to say, if the phone rings, I'm going to interrupt my prayer. It becomes interrupted, invalid. So the intention must be firm from the beginning till the end of the prayer without any hesitation or interruption. We're not talking about the one who receives me thoughts from the devil, what we call waswas. These thoughts from the devil whispers to him, interrupt your prayer, don't continue. But that's from the devil and his heart is determined to continue the prayer. This does not affect the validity of his prayer. Amongst the invalidators of the prayer, is to turn away from the direction of the Qibla, 
of the prayer. You know, when you pray, you make sure after making ijtihad that this is the direction of the Qibla. So while you are praying, you keep your chest while standing facing the Qibla, you do not turn away. So if you hear something at the back, if you turn by your body to see what's happening, that invalidates your prayer. But moving the head right or left while your chest is towards the direction of the Qibla does not invalidate your prayer. But moving the chest from the direction of the Qibla, turning away from the direction of the Qibla, this invalidates your prayer. Eating and drinking, even if it were to be little, if this is done deliberately. Let us say someone had something in his mouth, he started the prayer, he forgot that he had, let, let us say, that food in his mouth. As he started the prayer, now he knows he is praying, he remembered he has this in his mouth, he needs to spit it out. If he swallows this food or drink, even if, it's, if it were to be little, this invalidates his prayer. There is something that is very important that I need to warn you about which is some people might drink coffee, cordial, just before they want to pray without rinsing their mouth thoroughly. So they drink cordial or coffee, then it's time for the prayer. They get up to pray. The saliva in the mouth is still mixed with the coffee, let us say. So they swallow this saliva that is not pure saliva, it's mixed with coffee, this invalidates their prayer. So if such a thing were to happen to you, make sure you rinse your mouth thoroughly, clean your mouth before you pray. al qahqaha laughing, the out loud laughter if two letters were to be uttered in such a case, deliberately this invalidates one's prayer and the last thing is apostasy and apostasy takes one out of Islam apostasy is exiting Islam by uttering a blasphemous statement believing a blasphemous belief or doing a blasphemous action so if one while praying prostrates to an idol, this is a blasphemous action. This invalidates his prayer and that takes him out of Islam. If one were to utter something blasphemous intentionally, then this takes one out of Islam and this invalidates the prayer as well. If one were to believe something blasphemous while praying, this invalidates his prayer and it takes one out of Islam. The scholars of Islam mentioned that apostasy is of three categories. Blasphemous actions, blasphemous beliefs and blasphemous sayings. Blasphemous sayings such as swearing at Allah, at a messenger, at the religion of Islam, at a prophet, at an angel. These are blasphemous sayings. Blasphemous beliefs such as to believe that Allah is a body or has a shape or volume or that Allah exists in a place or direction. This is blasphemous belief. Blasphemous action such as to prostrate to an idol or to prostrate to the sun or the moon or to throw the book of the Quran and Mus'haf in the trash deliberately and knowingly then this is blasphemous action we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from such abhorrent acts and we ask Allah to make our end as righteous believers Amin. and Allah knows best we say la ilaha illallah three times